Things are not looking good at Stellantis North America. They're on a course for disaster. And that's not me saying that. That's their own U.S. dealer council in an open letter to CEO Carlos Tavares. Airing corporate grievances like this almost never happens, but the dealers are pissed. The models that are affordable to the customers have been removed from the showroom because they're unprofitable to the company. Employees are depressed with downsizing and layoffs, and relations with the UAW are the worst in Detroit. The letter makes it clear that all the blame lies with the CEO, not the dealers, not the UAW, not the government. Sales have plummeted before Stellantis has even released its onslaught of battery electric vehicles. In this video, I want to take a look at what has happened to Stellantis North America and to peek into their plans to see if they're sufficient to save the company formerly known as Chrysler. Breaking news. As I was publishing this video, news came out that Stellantis has begun its search for their next CEO. Now, that does not mean he was fired. His contract expires January 2026. So there has to be some internal discussions about what to do. And maybe they just extend his contract. But you know the saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. And somebody clearly wanted this internal activity to get out. The pressure is on Tavares to make things better. Maybe he has until next February when their 2024 annual report comes out. And as you're about to see, the product improvements aren't coming all that quickly. Can Carlos save Chrysler? <laughs> well, many in the U.S. believe he's the one who broke it. When Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot Citroën combined to form Stellantis, they knew each other's strengths and weaknesses. Stellantis is incorporated as a Dutch company, but production decisions are made in offices outside of Paris. Chrysler, Daimler Chrysler, Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, Fiat Chrysler, now just call them Stellantis North America, has its headquarters north of Detroit. FCA's North American operations were very profitable, but not because they had the latest and greatest product. Rather, they were masters at squeezing every penny out of a platform. The WK2 platform had a long and successful life. The Dodge Journey wasn't great, but it was a cheap car to lease. Ram is selling the pre-refresh classic version of the 1500 still today, and nothing compares to the Dodge Charger, Challenger, and Chrysler 300. Their North American lineup needs an extreme makeover and to begin its transition to electrification. Dealers don't make their commissions off of corporate profits. They make their money moving metal, and that has slowed dramatically. Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram dealers are used to moving quantities of Jeeps and Rams, selling to people who shop for value and deep discounts. But leadership made some tough calls about the North American showroom. Affordable models like the Renegade and Cherokee were outdated and unprofitable, but dealers were able to move them. Leaders decided to stop importing the Renegade and to shut down production at Belvedere. The Compass is nice, but it only received a slight refresh in a very competitive segment, and the more affordable Ram Classic is finally being put out to pasture. Prior to the merger, Fiat Chrysler leadership was already moving Jeep upmarket, intending to turn the Wagoneer into a sub-brand of its own. Stellantis, like other automakers, have learned the simple truth that it's more profitable to sell one vehicle at $60,000 than to sell two at $30,000 each. But that means the salespeople should expect to sell half the number of vehicles they once did. And the rise in interest rates has made it difficult to sell that $60,000 plus vehicle. Dealers want Carlos Tavares to slash prices now, forget about profitability, and regain market share that it has lost. Yeah, good luck with that. In 2021, when Stellantis was formed, he gave some of the many, many overlapping brands 10 years to prove themselves. Now, three years into it, he's telling them to get profitable or get dropped, like now. This prompted the great-grandson of Walter P. Chrysler to write a scathing letter, offering to buy the at-risk brand as it approaches its 100th anniversary. I'll put a link to that in the notes. It, it is a very touching letter, and it comes from the heart. 
but it also has a less than 0% chance of ever happening. Stellantis has shown us some of its product turnaround plans. Let's try to make sense of it. They are the half of the Detroit two and a half and by far the furthest behind on battery electric vehicles. They do great with plug-in hybrids. As far as full electrics, they're late, but that gives them the opportunity to learn from others' missteps. Stellantis has decided to go with a different approach, multi-energy platforms, where one vehicle can offer multiple powertrain offerings. They're not the only ones doing this. BMW, for example, they have some models designed the same way. On the positive side, it allows for production flexibility, so you can offer a range of powertrains in one vehicle, manufacturing flexibility, so one plant can make vehicles with different powertrains, absorbing changes in market demand to keep that plant running at a profitable level. And it focuses all your engineering resources on one platform that can achieve high production volumes, all very efficient. On the downside, scar tissue. This is a term where a battery EV has designed compromises to accommodate things found with the combustion engine vehicle, adding cost, mass, and complexity. The Dodge Charger has a large transmission tunnel in the body structure for the combustion engine variant, but the Charger Daytona doesn't need that much space. This leads to untapped efficiencies, potential cost reductions to the EV that get rejected because it would interfere with the ability to offer a combustion powertrain. This is in part why Ford recently changed their EV strategy. Incremental changes to their platform would not get them to where they need to be. To get their EVs profitable, they need to think outside of their traditional design constraints, and thus they formed a skunk work team working in California on a completely new platform. Stellantis has four new platforms, Stella Small, Medium, and Large, and Stella Frame. We won't get to see Stella Small here, and there are questions about how that overlaps with their future partnership with Chinese EV maker Leap Motors. I'll be talking more about that in a future video. We will see Stella medium and large vehicles here, and we've already seen Stella Frame, which is the underpinnings of the Ram 1500 Rev, their battery EV pickup, and the Ram 1500 Ram Charger, which is a Rev, a range extended EV that some prefer to call E-Rev. Either way, it has a gas engine to recharge the battery for longer range, particularly when towing. And honestly, that offering should have GM and Ford pooping in their diapers. It won't be cheap, and it could be a game changer. Now, now you know what? It will be a game changer in large pickups and SUVs, and that's where the Detroit 2.5 make all their money. This chart suggests that their new products will heavily favor electric vehicles, and that's true, but PHEVs and REVs use both gas and electricity, so easing American consumers into plugging in. I made an attempt to add up all the numbers they provided. Let's go through the math. Two E-REVs, or REVs, that would be the Jeep Wagoneer 4xE and the Ram Ram Charger. Done. Two PHEVs. One has to be the Gladiator 4xE, which is coming, the other could be the Dodge Hornet, which it actually launched as a 2024 model after the base gas powertrain version. Or is the Hornet considered a pass vehicle and there's another PHEV variant on the way? To be determined. Battery electrics. Nine, huh? All right, let's go through this. Ram Promaster EV, Fiat 500E, Jeep Wagoneer S, Dodge Charger Daytona, Jeep Recon, Ram 1500 Rev, and hopefully the Chrysler Airflow concept finally goes into production. All right, that's seven. What else are they counting? There's the Banshee version of the Daytona. They could be counting that as a separate powertrain. Alfa Romeo, a new Stelvio is expected next year with a Bev variant. And then there's Maserati. They have the Grey Cali Fogore and the Gran Cabrio Fogore. Historically, Maserati acted independently under Fiat Chrysler, but now under Stellantis, they may just be added up in this chart. A 2027 Dodge Stealth that replaces the Durango and a mainstream Jeep UV is coming late in 2027. Additionally, there have been comments that Jeep is looking at making a gas version of the Recon or the Wagoneer S. Personally, I think a hybrid version of the Recon would sell great. 
it would cannibalize some Wrangler sales, yes, but they need to punch back at Bronco wherever they can. Speaking of hybrid, there have been comments about the return of the Cherokee, but off of what platform in 2026, I do not know. They indicated only one new hybrid powertrain coming. They're offering a mild hybrid e-torque system in recent years, but the fuel savings of that powertrain really not worth mentioning. A new mainstream UV, a new Compass, and a new Renegade with a low price BEV variant are all coming, but not soon. This is what they need now, but it's not coming soon enough. Ram has also wanted a midsize pickup for years, and we thought we knew their plans. In South America, they sell the Rampage. I did a video on the launch of that truck last year. It's good looking, but it's much smaller than you think. The UAW was promised a new midsize pickup would be built at the idled Belvedere plant, but also not soon enough. Rumors are that the multi-energy pickup that would include both a combustion engine and BEV variants is now delayed until 2028. I did a recent video on the challenges of the electric vehicle industry and concluded that automakers who don't make uncomfortable decisions won't survive. Well, that's like a triple negative. Said more clearly, automakers need to make uncomfortable decisions to survive. Playing it safe is actually dangerous. Tavares removed the old product out of the US showrooms and now dealers are pissed. He formed a joint venture with a Chinese EV maker to sell and build outside of China. Politicians may not like that. Shifting more global Jeep production from high-cost countries to best-cost countries probably didn't ask permission of the UAW. Their plan to remake the U.S. showrooms, though, seems to be coming painfully slow. Long term, Carlos Tavares is giving Stellantis North America the extreme makeover it needs to survive the disruptive transition that the auto industry is going through. In the short term, though, the dealers are right. Dealers are a pain in the ass in the U.S., but they know how to move product, and customers expect to find value in their showrooms, not overpriced Grand Wagoneers and premium electric vehicles that are starting to arrive. Legacy automakers have tried to reform their dealers in the past, but most CEOs give up. Carlos Tavares, though, is unlike other CEOs. He seems to enjoy making tough decisions and unpopular ones at that, but I don't see how he can avoid slashing prices and cutting into margins to start moving more volume of vehicles. Their next dealer council meeting is in just a couple of weeks, so if any news comes out of that, I'll be sure to include that in the notes. And don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Thank you for watching.